So, Lone Rider here, and I uh, wanted to talk about something you've probably heard on the news, this, this idea that, uh, you know, people making the argument, well, nobody needs a military-style assault rifle. Of course, they're, they're usually talking about weapons that aren't military-style assault rifles. They're usually talking about, you know, civilian semi-automatic weapons, but whatever. Uh, the point is, if we consider this argument itself without respect for whether or not it's being uh, abused in this case, because, uh, you know, they're making an argument, and then they're applying it to things that don't fit the argument they're making. So, yeah, that in itself should just allow you to dismiss the argument. But the danger with that is then we never examine the argument, and what if they do try to bring it up again in a different case? Uh, maybe someplace where it does fit. So let's just dismiss the argument once and for all. Does, does this concept uh, of that, that you, you should not be allowed to own weapons that are equal to those of the military um, in, in effectiveness. Uh, is this a concept that has existed at any other point in, in history, in the Western world? Uh, well, we can go back to the medieval period. Um, not everybody carried swords all the time. In fact, some places there were rules against it. But uh, what pretty much everybody had on them at the time was a dagger of some kind. And they usually looked something... Oh, where did I put it? Here we go. They usually look something like this. Oh, this is actually a short one. Um, this uh, is a rondel dagger, and you see it's got the guard there. Uh, that's to prevent your hand from slipping down the blade if you're stabbing uh, with it. Uh, these were primarily stabbing weapons, in particular, uh, of interest to the topic today. They were designed to penetrate the resistive material under the gaps of armor. So these were designed uh, for the battlefield or the duel. They were essentially... They were militarized daggers and they were designed specifically for killing people in armor, a situation you would never encounter on the streets in, let's say, a civilian self-defense scenario, because people didn't just walk around wearing armor. That was for the battlefield. Now, historically, there were distinctions between battlefield weapons and weapons that were more suitable for civilian life or that didn't have a purpose outside of the battlefield. For example, uh, a giant axe or a spear, nobody's going to walk around with that. Nobody's going to want to walk around with a halberd. Um, a spear might have use, for example, in hunting, but you're not going to walk around town with it. Um, however, as far as swords and daggers were concerned, um, you know, there was... You, you're looking at it and you're like, okay, civilian weapon, military weapon, it's the same, right? And more to the point, there was no legal distinction. Yes, people obviously knew that certain weapons were more suited to the battlefield and certain weapons were more suited to civilian carry. But that's not to say there was any there, were, there, there was a rule against civilians carrying the military type weapons or simply owning them. Uh, the only laws that I've uh, that I'm aware of uh, from the medieval period about weapons involve bearing them in public, carrying them in public, uh, and what you can walk around with. As far as I know, there's nothing about ownership. Uh, restricting it one way or the other. Um, but more to the point, a popular medieval carry item was the rondel dagger. Pretty much everybody in the medieval period had a knife or dagger on them at some point. And the rondel dagger was a very popular type. But the rondel dagger is a type that was designed specifically for military combat, for killing a knight, an armored man. So why were people walking around with them in the streets? Well, we don't know. We don't know whether it was just fashion uh, people felt they were cool. Um, people wanted to be associated with the knights, whether they were or not. We don't know exactly, you know, maybe it was the fact that medieval clothing is thicker and more resistive. So even though you're not going to encounter people wearing armor on the street, if you do have to use your weapon for self-defense, it's advantageous to have one that's good at penetrating resistive material. I, I honestly don't know. A lot of it may just have been style and rule of cool. You know, hey, I got the same dagger that the knight has. Look at me. But for whatever reason, um, medieval people carried the same sidearm as was used on the battlefield, and nobody batted an eye. There was no legal distinction made. Was there a practical distinction between something suitable for civilian life um, or something that might be suitable for civilian life and military life, depending, like a rival dagger, and something that's really only suitable for military life, like a, a halberd? Yes. They weren't stupid, medieval people. They, they understood that certain things were good for certain things and they weren't good for other things. However, 
the fact that they made a distinction between something you might carry on the battlefield and something you might carry on your person, let's say on the battlefield and off, doesn't mean there was a legal distinction. And as far as I can find, any of the rules regarding weapons from that time period dealt purely with what you could carry and not with what you could own. And in particular, like I said, th one of the most popular carry items, the, the medieval dagger, one of the most popular forms of that dagger was the rival dagger, a weapon that was designed specifically for killing people in armor. So I think we could safely say that historically, in the medieval period, this idea that you shouldn't have the same uh, efficacy in your weapon that the, that the military has, you shouldn't have the same type of weapon in terms of function that the military has, is completely wrong. It never existed back then. Uh, they had the same civilians walking around with the same type of dagger that you used to kill a knight on a battlefield, and nobody batted in an eye, and there were no legal restrictions on it. So, in the medieval period, there were a lot of rules, but that wasn't one of them. Fast forward to the American Revolution, right? Or the, the War for Independence. Um, you know, it's now the 18th century. We're setting ourselves. Uh, uh, apart from Britain, we want to be our own our own place with our own rules. And there's a war on. And one of the most iconic uh, parts of the Revolutionary War is the focus on, uh, you know, woodsman characters who used um, uh, long rifles, Kentucky long rifles, uh, Pennsylvania long rifles. Uh, these were smaller bore than their military musket counterparts. Uh, but they had a longer barrel, uh, they were rifled. And the longer barrel gave you at least two advantages that I can think of. One, a longer sight radius, and two, it gave you, you know, the rifling to, to spin the bullet longer. The downside is they were a smaller caliber because these originally were hunting rifles, civilian hunting rifles, repurposed into uh, weapons of war. And they were, because of the rifling, they got fouled more easily and so forth. Um, uh, anyway, these, this was whether or not uh, characters with uh, rifles like this played a huge role in the Revolutionary War, or whether they were just, you know, they, they were just one part of the whole thing. The point is that um, it was common knowledge at the time that many civilian hunting rifles, although smaller bore, were more accurate and therefore potentially more deadly. Huh. Okay, so yeah, not everybody had a Kentucky long rifle, of course. That's a myth. That's a Hollywood generated thing. Um, a lot of people, if they were in the you know the regular kind of an army, they did have to bring some of their own stuff. But there was some stuff issued. You also had committees of safety that stockpiled either ammunition or weapons, or in some cases, you know, other accoutrements. Um, you know, but generally speaking, you did have to bring. If you were in the militia, you had to bring uh, certain items, and of course that. Could include your gun. Uh, we do know that uh, the phrase "well regulated" and you know uh, the Second Amendment right to bear arms refers not to modern gun control regulations. Sorry, guys, uh, but it actually refers to, in the context of the time and what they were talking about, that a person show up with regulation equipment, equipment, so that that a person show up with basically the things they have to show up with in order to be an effective militia soldier. Uh, this isn't dissimilar, by the way, to what would happen in a um, you know, medieval period if somebody wanted to hire out as an archer to the king's army. Um, they wanted they'd have to be able to show they could shoot, shoot you know, arrows in a certain amount, and, you know, a certain degree of accuracy. But they'd also have to bring their own bow, uh, their own um, you know, clothing or armor, uh, their own sidearms, such as a dagger or a sword, uh, etc. The arrows would be issued. Um, arrows, I think they were called livery arrows, were one of the very first items issued by uh, a government, in this case the British government, um, to its soldiers, but the soldiers had to provide pride all their own, all their other stuff. And it was no different hundreds of years later in the 18th century when the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, was being written. So when that was, when they said well regulated in there, they wanted to make it clear that people knew to bring their own stuff, basically. You have to have regulation gear. Okay, that's fair enough. But what does that mean? Well, it, it, it means that it was common knowledge that civilians would have 
weapons that would be capable of being used in a military context. And when you put that together with the culturally iconic and folk hero status of the woodsmen who used the Kentucky long rifles and, and things like that, what you end up with is actually uh, a historical fact that not only uh, was this view one not shared by the founders of this country when they wrote the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, uh, it was also one that didn't exist at the time in any kind of a widespread manner because the historical fact you're left with is that at the time, not only did civilians own weapons that were capable of being used as stand-ins for military muskets, many civilian weapons, including things like the Kentucky and Pennsylvania long rifles, were potentially more accurate and therefore potentially more dangerous. Yes, they get downsides. They're slower to load, longer barrels, more cumbersome. Uh, the rifling gets fouled and it gets gritty, uh, you know, dirty. But the point is that everything is a downside. The, the simple fact is this view that people shouldn't be allowed to own a weapon that's as dangerous as a military weapon. Did that exist in the medieval period? No. Did it exist during the time of the American Revolution? No. In fact, its opposite was true. By the time we get to the period of the American Revolution, you're allowed to have weapons and it's accepted that you'll have weapons that are potentially more dangerous than what's current military issue. And that trend only continues, by the way. Fast forward to the Civil War, the 1860s. The average soldier is still carrying a muzzle-loading black powder musket, or in this case, rifle. Uh, the difference is that between uh, the 18th and 19th centuries here is that the average soldier is now carrying one that is a rifle barrel and that has a percussion lock instead of a flint lock. But it's still a single shot muzzle loading weapon. What does the regular civilian carry though? Mostly the same thing because they were prevalent. They were cheap and they were, you know, durable and simple and robust. However, if the everyday civilian wanted something a little different, what could he do? Well, he could go out and buy any of the breech loading or manually repeating firearms out there, some of which hold held like a dozen bullets. Uh, you could start with things like uh, Samuel Colt's revolver and other revolvers at the time. You could um, include in that, I guess, also other repeating pistols, pepper box pistols, double barreled pistols. Uh, you could move on to rifles uh, from breech loading uh, rifles all the way up through, you know, lever action repeaters like the Volcanic rifle, the Henry rifle, uh, etc. Uh, and all the way through the, the uh, late 1800s, you know, yes, cavalry guys got breech loading or sometimes repeating carbines because it's hard to load a muzzle loading long rifle on a, on a horse. But um, generally speaking, the, the rank and file infantry soldier. Yeah, he was using a, a single shot weapon uh, pretty much to the end of the late 1800s. Wow. Whereas civilians were walking around with all kinds of repeating firearms. And there was no... So not only could you get the same kind of gun that the military had, you could get one that was actually more impressive, more dangerous, had more firepower, etc. Um, it might not have been as large a caliber, but if you think about it, one of the reasons that um, repeating rifles tend to be in smaller calibers is because you have to fit more bullets in there. If you had, you know, self-contained cartridges that were really large, it would be very heavy and cumbersome. You might not be able to hold as many bullets. Think about the difference between uh, American revolvers, which were uh, usually a middle caliber, and British revolvers, which were a large caliber. The American revolvers held six shots. The British usually only held five. Why is that? Well, the British wanted a larger cartridge. And this is usually in a, a larger caliber bullet. This is usually in, in reference to, they were involved in a lot of colonial warfare. They needed to be able to stop people who might be charging at them in a fervor, uh, a situation we didn't really see in the United States because we weren't a colonial power in that sense. Um, in fact, we'd revolted against being made to be a colonial power. So, uh, you know, uh, whereas you look at England at the time, it was still this big empire and had all these colonial possessions. And so around the same time as Americans were walking around with 36 caliber called navies, the, um, the 
you know, people in, in, in England and in parts of the British Empire were having, um, they did use some cults there, two cults actually set up a firearms factory in England at one point. But um, the, the indigenous, if you will, form of revolver that developed in, in England and uh, that part of Europe uh, was, was more geared on uh, that it'd be double action and larger caliber. And these were both important to the idea of being able to stop a charging foe. Uh, whereas for the Americans, it was literally just a sidearm. But for the British person, if you're a British officer, you might have, you know, your pistol in one hand and a sword in the other or a, something. I don't know. Uh, but th the point is that if you were going to be charged by somebody during a colonial warfare, you wanted to be able to put that person down before they got to you. Um, and it's not like the movies where you just shoot somebody and they drop dead, right? So the British wanted uh, double action. They also wanted larger, cart larger cartridges, larger bullets. Well, larger bullets means you can hold only so many. So instead of six, a lot of the British revolvers ended up holding five. It's the same thing with some of these manually repeating pistols. Now, here's something very interesting. Let me get rid of this. Gosh, I swear, telemarketers are a bloody nuisance. Um, the, the same thing is true of man manually repeating rifles. They might have had a smaller caliber than the military ones, but that's because they had to fit more bullets in there. And the point is, it still gives you, like, you know, 10 shots or 12 shots compared to one shot, and then oh, i got to sit there and, and reload. Historically, in other words, this didn't exist. And up until your grandparents' lifetime. Uh, I don't know about you, my grandparents got married at the end of World War II. So in the, 19, in the early 30s, prior to the passage of the 1934 National Firearms Act, and this idea that we're going to you know, restrict uh, you know, uh, weapons that are capable of firing more than one shot for each pull of the trigger, um, you'll notice they didn't restrict military weapons, they just restrict weapons capable of firing more than one shot for each pull of the trigger. The irony is that, except for things like machine guns mounted on tripods, most of the military weapons of the day were either semi-automatic or bolt action. So it is, it is interesting that they were restricting, they're basically saying to civilians, you can't have small arms that are more powerful than the military. It was never meant to be you can't have the same in that sense, because at the time this was passed, uh, we didn't have military small arms that were capable of fully automatic fire with the exception of some machine guns but those were were not common it wasn't you know it wasn't a common thing uh in terms of the the average rifle issued to the average infantry, infantry soldier if you compare that to what they were restricting in the nfa they were they actually weren't restricting that they were restricting weapons more powerful than that more potent than that so actually if you look at the nfa it's not so much saying that you can't have the same kind of gun that the military has. It's saying you can't have a gun, the same kind of gun that's more powerful than what the military had at the time. Here's the thing. The military now uses weapons such as the M4 or M16 that are capable of select fire. So this idea that was created during your grandparents' uh, lifetime and implemented during your parents' lifetime, so it's only two generations old. It didn't exist during any other period in our history or the history of the world. But now it exists. And it's being used as a talking point to push all kinds of weird and vague and cockamamie laws. And, you know, this, this is a, a, a mistaken idea that only goes back, like I said, about a generation or two to the 1930s. I don't know about you. I have a great deal of respect for my parents. And I hope you do too. But not everything our parents' generation left us is worth preserving. And I think we should ask ourselves, is this delusion that, you know, there's somehow citizens shouldn't be allowed to own the same type of weapons as the military, when historically they've actually been allowed to own weapons that are more dangerous than those used by the military. Even, even if you go back to before guns were a thing, right? If you go back to the Middle Ages, this is true. Uh, this has never been true throughout any period in our, in our history uh, in, in, in Western civilization, as far as I know. Maybe even in the civilization, in the history of the world and civilizations generally. 
But in particular, as far as you know, Europe and England and Western civilization and the United States is concerned, this has never existed. Certainly in the history of this country, it never existed until the last generation or two. If this idea had existed, would there be a Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights? I honestly don't think so. Because if you think about it, when that amendment was written, civilian weapons were as dangerous as the, you know, and, and as capable as the military weapons, and you were, and were as capable of using one in a, in a battlefield setting. And some civilian weapons, like the long rifles, Kentucky long rifles, which were rifled, were actually more dangerous because they were more accurate, or arguably more dangerous anyway. Whether or not, you know, what their overall effectiveness was, the point is that particular rifle, comparing that to the issued musket of the day, was it, you know, well, it was definitely more accurate. You could hit somebody further away in a range where they can't hit you. Yeah, that, um, that to me says more effective, more dangerous, more powerful uh, in the sense of its usage, even if it is a smaller caliber. So here's the thing. If this idea had existed, our Bill of Rights wouldn't look the way it looks today. That alone is alarming. It should make you question this idea. But the fact that it's never existed in any period prior in history, why is that? And then when you look at what the people who support this idea have given us generally, intrusive, vague, cockamamie laws, disarmed public spaces where, you know, yes, there's an advantage to being publicly disarmed in the sense of, you know, weapons are cumbersome to carry around. You don't have to do that. It's less, you know, uh, less hassle. Um, there is a, a, a slight benefit in terms of you're a little less likely that, you know, spur the moment fights or brawls turn into killings or uh, serious woundings. So yes, uh, there are some benefits to being a disarmed society, but of course, there's a huge major drawback and people would be stupid to ignore that, which is that it gives you mass killings, right? I mean, you wouldn't have mass killings in a society that wasn't publicly disarmed by and large. And yes, I know there's that one guy out there who, who has a carry permit and he carries every day and he's gonna say, what about me? You're the exception, dude. I wish there were more people like you. But you're the exception, okay? The vast majority of us, when we go out in public, we are defenseless. And guess what? Crazy, nasty, mean people who want to do bad stuff for whatever reason, whether it's because they're nuts out or whether it's because they're just, you know, evil or, or, or whatever. Um, people who want to do bad stuff know that we're defenseless, especially in certain places, especially in places where, you know, there's a large group of people gathered together. That's precisely the type of place where historically um, people would be least likely to be attacked, right? But now it's like a shooting gallery. Why? Is it really because the guns now hold more bullets? Or is it because, hey, let's face it, if you did walk into a tavern in, you know, six, 1762, pull out, let's say, the most advanced weapon of the day, like a giant longsword and say, I'm gonna kill everybody. Every single person in that tavern would out with their daggers and be like, no, you're not. And it would probably stop right there. And even if he did try to hurt people, it's not just that he's gotta fight one guy with a dagger, because the dagger's not really good against a sword, even a big one. It's that he's gotta fight everybody with their daggers at the same time. And more importantly, he knows they have daggers, so he's less likely to even try and go in there and kill people. Whereas today, what do the bad guys know? They know that chances are nobody has anything. So, you know, is it a surprise that they do their killing sprees and they're able to get away with them and they usually pick locations accordingly? Yeah, is what it is. This is what the gun control view has given us. And I'm not saying the solution is for everybody to walk around armed like a pirate. Uh, but what I am simply saying is you'd be stupid to acknowledge that, well, both the gun control laws in terms of the specific restrictions and in terms of the overall concepts that they push and the cultural shift that they're pushing with how we regard uh, weapons and, and firearms in particular. Uh, there may be some benefits to some aspects of that, like a disarmed society. Again, this will be real cumbersome to carry on a bike ride, right? Um, so I'm glad I don't, and that it's not socially expected of me to carry it all the time. Uh, on the other hand, again, there's a huge downside. If people know nobody is carrying anything, or very unlikely to be, then all of a sudden you're very vulnerable and uh, 
you know, a person killing a whole bunch of people in one fell swoop becomes more likely. So that is actually something that gun control has. That's a legacy of, of gun control and of the cultural concepts that have come with it about weapons and the carrying of weapons. Um, it's just, it's the way it is, right? Um, so that, yeah, there's some benefits in terms of you don't have to carry around big clunky things. Um, it's not expected that you do so. Um, on the other hand, if you want to, you're usually not allowed to. What does that mean? Well, bad guys know that you're going to be defenseless and you're in trouble. Uh, so this idea that dates only to really our, our parents' generation. And like I said, I have respect for my parents and I think you should too. But um, not everything that our parents' generation left us is worth preserving. And this modern construct of gun control that ignores the entirety of human history and the relationship between what civilians had and what the military had and whether or not there even was a legal distinction. Um, and then also ignores all the bad stuff that ideas like this cause in the modern times, such as they lead to the advent of mass killings and things like that, where previously they, you know, they just, it would never be considered. Nobody, nobody in, in, the, in the 15th century would consider it acceptable to go around unarmed without at least having something like this. And everybody knew that, which is why you didn't have people go into bars and taverns and start killing folks, or even try to. And again, I'm not saying the solution is for everybody to start carrying one of these. I'm just saying that, acknowledge that this is the trade-off that these people are trying to get you to make. A handful of benefits from a disarmed society, but also a handful of big problems, most of which they then blame on people of the other view who want to defend the idea of people having arms, right? How many times have you heard that the reason we have these mass killings is because of all the guns? Has anybody ever addressed the issue that there's always been bad people in history and they've always got their hands on weapons? But they never felt as free to kill. And they never felt as free to kill as many people in one fell swoop without being stopped. Why is that? Why is that? Do you really think it's because, yes, the bad guy gets his hand on a gun is a bad thing. I wish we could prevent that. I think everybody does. But it's only one part of the problem. A bigger part is that the bad guy is the only one there with a gun. And if you don't understand why that would make a difference potentially, especially while people are like trying to hide under tables or desks and avoid being killed, then um, you're living in la-la land. All right? And again, I'm not saying the solution is for everybody to go around armed with weapons. I'm simply pointing out that a side effect of a disarmed society are these mass killings. The very mass killings they want to further disarm society to try and prevent, or so they say. Um, not a good track record. So I think a lot of this gun control BS, we should look at it and we should say, you know, it's not worth preserving this. It's not worth keeping this. Could you look at something like the 1934 National Firearms Act and say it was understandable? Hey, you had a lot of, you know, muckraking press back in the day. You have... You had sensational news stories about gangsters with Tommy guns and Bonnie and Clyde. Is it understandable that they passed this, there was a push to pass this law when they did? Yes. Is it understandable they actually went through and passed it? No. I think they should have said, we understand why this is popular, but it's a bad idea. It sets a bad precedent. But they did it anyway. Now, however, I think we have to look at it and say, is it, it was never a good idea then, although it may have been understandable, given the coverage and the incidents at the time. Is it a good idea today? I don't think it is. I don't think it's a good idea, especially if it's encouraging these false narratives of, oh, well, nobody should have the same kind of gun as the military has. When they're not even talking about guns that are the same. Again, they're talking about a civilian AR-15 and a military-style M16 or M4. They're not the same. But even if they were, that argument's bogus. It hasn't applied to any other period in human history. Why should we let it apply to us now? They're literally the only time in the history of the world, as far as I know, that this argument has been in effect as a thing is from 1934 to today. What about all the other periods in history? What about when the people who founded this country wrote the gosh darn constitution, which delineated the limits of powers that the government had and what it could and couldn't do? And more importantly, what rights the citizens explicitly had? And do you think that if this idea, like I said, if this idea had existed in the uh, 18th century, our Bill of Rights would look very different. 
And that's all you need to know about this idea and why it's a, it's a bad, bad thing to be a carjack. I understand why people buy into it. Just like I understand why with Bonnie and Clyde running around in Al Capone, people might have supported the 1934 National Firearms Act at the time. But I think we're, we know better now and we, we can look back at, at, the, at the bulk of history and be like, there's a reason they didn't have rules like this in the past and they also didn't have these mass murders. Huh. Let me think about that. Yeah. So anyway, just remember, as recently as your grandparents' day, there was no difference between, legal difference, between military and civilian firearms in that sense. Uh, uh, there was no difference between, uh, you know, uh, fully and semi-automatic. And as, again, you know, far back as the Civil War and the American Revolution, uh, people, regular people could walk into a store and buy a gun that could hold 10 times as many bullets as, um, you know, the military issue weapon of the day, as in the case of the Civil War, or that was potentially more accurate than the military weapon, as in the case of the American Revolution with the uh, long rifles, Kentucky long rifles. And even if it wasn't more accurate, at the very least, the, the common musket that was carried by the regular person was not much different than the musket that was military issue. A lot of times they were essentially the same thing. The military one might have had a bayonet log. That would be the difference. Or a stacking rod, something like that. So here's the deal. This idea that you shouldn't be allowed to have the same kind of weapons as the military, it's a, it's a relatively modern invention. It's a 20th century invention. And th I don't think there's a reason that we should be... be Prolonging this, put it out of its misery. Uh, again, if this if this concept was around and widely accepted the way it is now by people who don't know any better, at the time that the Constitution was being written, our Bill of Rights would look very different, and that is very frightening. And it makes you wonder where these people want to go with this. I think we all agree we don't like the idea of criminals running around with machine guns, but is that what they're really talking about here? Think about it. Think about the history and think about the context. Long rider out.